Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gospel text for today recounts the history of Jesus healing the deaf mute. And this is a healing like no other. So let us pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. I know it is very odd. I haven't met many people like myself who do this. You could call it an affliction of sorts. But I listen to about 10 sermons every week. To make matters worse, they're all bad. The worser, the better because eventually they're going to be used as fodder on the Pluck Chicken podcast, if you know about that. Preachers all the time, I hear them, they begin their sermons with, the Lord has laid this on my heart. Or, my favorite, I asked the Lord what to preach today, and this is what He told me. Something to that effect. And I find all of that to be tragic. These congregations sadly are left to the whims of whatever said pastor may have. But not you. You see, early on, the faithful developed a system called a lectionary. The purpose of which is that in one calendar year, there are assigned readings for every single Sunday. And within the course of a 12-month span, all of the major doctrines in the Christian faith are covered. Everything from creation to the fall to the birth and to the life and to the teachings and to, this, to sin and death and burial of Jesus Christ to the expansion of the church, including even how the world will end and will, how everything will culminate with new heavens and a new earth with you and I in a glorified body. Then you just do it all over again the next year. And then the next. And then the next. With all of the major doctrines covered in a single year. The goal of which is that the whole counsel of God is covered. And that is no different today. You are not left to my whims. You are not left to my impulses or my desires of what I want to share. What I've been given to preach, you've already heard. Jesus is healing of the deaf mute. From the start of Mark's gospel, there has been trouble everywhere. There was a leper, there's a paralytic, there's a man with a withered hand. There's this woman who can't stop bleeding. One little girl who drops dead. Another little girl is possessed by a demon. And now enter a man who could neither speak nor hear. We don't know much more than that. We don't know if he could care for himself. We don't know if he could work. We don't know his name. We don't know his age. We simply know that he had trouble. Yet another example of how wrong things are in the world. Jesus was traveling in the region of the Decapolis, that being the ten cities, of which was a land that was flowing with stones. This is how Jews refer to the Goyim, to the Gentiles, to the stones. That being unclean Gentiles. This is the same area where Jesus excised a legion of demons from a man, casting them into the herd of pigs who then jump off the cliff into the sea. Did you know that you can go visit that cliff today? I've been there. Took pictures of it. I, I didn't jump off the cliff, and I don't advise you do it either. But it's there. You can take a gander at it. Well, since then, word has gotten around about this Jesus, that he has power over demons. Surely, if he's got power over demons, he can heal this deaf mute man. So friends, bring him to Jesus, saying, please lay your hand on him and make him better. Now, deafness is not a disease. You're not going to die by 
being deaf, it's not life-threatening, but a world of silence is isolating, and our Lord has mercy, has compassion on him. He pulls the man aside privately, and then he does something that is quite unique. He sticks his fingers into the man's ears. It's got to be the best wet willy ever, but beside that, he then spits presumably on his fingers and then pinches the man's tongue. He then lifts his eyes to heaven and sighs, or better yet, groans. Now all of this is the prologue to the main event. For when Jesus speaks, that's when the miracle happens. The word spoken to the man's ears is ephta. This is an Aramaic word meaning be opened. Have you seen those videos? This is completely different, but it kind of touches on the point. You've seen those videos where they put hearing aids on a child for the first time? Oh my goodness. And the child hears the mother speak for the first time. <sighs> Tears me up. Well, in the same way, this was the first word that this man ever heard. And that's all it takes from Jesus. Just a word. It's called a performative word. Meaning that the word causes whatever is being spoken to, to act. Just like, let there be light. And there was light. It's a powerful, performative word word even to ears that are good as dead and to a tongue that is fit for the grave. Those things do not hinder our Lord. For at his word, the man's ears, they open, his tongue is released. You don't need to call the speech therapist. No need for rehab. Praise be to God. But it does seem unusual, doesn't it? Saliva, ears, touch, word. Why did our Lord go through all of the hassle if He could just make it happen instantaneously? I mean, we all know that He could. So why the ritual? Why the, the liturgy, so to speak? Why the element? Why the touch? Why the word? Well, because our Lord heals as He wishes to heal. And more times than not, he brings about a healing using the word that is coupled with a physical element. Now, Luther found this account irresistible in that it was taken up by the church in ancient baptismal liturgies. Before entering the church, the pastor would take the candidate for baptism, whether it's a baby or whether it's an adult, touch his finger to his or her tongue and then to the candidate's ear. Luther's order of baptism from 1523, this is the way it reads, quote, Then the priest shall take spittle with his finger, touch the right ear therewith, and say, Ephtha. That is, be thou opened. Now for you germaphobes, you wince, but it is the great baptismal confession of the church because when you're born, you can't hear God's word. Those parents who say, oh, we've decided to dedicate the child to God and not have them baptized. We'll wait and let the child decide for themselves. What fool? Do the parents wait to let the child decide if they need their diaper changed? Do the parents wait to let the child decide if they need their teeth cleaned? Do the parents wait to let the child decide to decide when to start school? Hey, buddy, it's up to you whenever you want to start. No, they don't. Why? Because they're good parents. And they want the best for their children. And good parents, they take their children to holy baptism because they know it's where one is reborn by both water, physical element, and the Word. 
How do we know that? God promised it. It's where Jesus effed us them, opening their ears and loosing their tongue. Now these embellishments Jesus uses actually reminds us of the mystery that God uses means. He uses physical elements to do His work. And you know this, but just to run through a few, God used the blood of the slaughtered lamb spread over the doorpost to save the children of Israel from the death of the firstborn. He used Moses' rod lifted over the water to divide the Red Sea and make a path of dry ground for his church, his congregation that was fleeing Egypt. He used the bronze serpent lifted up on a pole by Moses to heal the people who were bitten by a serpent. He used a coal taken from the altar of incense to purge Isaiah's sin. And he used the water of the humble Jordan River to wash away Naaman's leprosy. The use of physical things is true in the New Testament as well, as Jesus uses spittle or mud or the hem of his garment to do the work of healing. You'll recall in the book of Acts that God uses Peter's shadow and uses Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons to heal people as well. This is how the Lord delivers His gifts through means. It's no different today. For many of you, it did start at the holy font of baptism. This is the first place where wrongs begin to be made right. There Jesus came to you and He splashed you with His forgiveness. He put His name on you. He adopted you, blessing you, and giving you His Holy Spirit. And this, of course, continues as the Lord uses what is on the altar as the Lord uses your pastor. Yet here is what I want you to grasp this morning, and it is a major doctrine of Christianity. We are the deaf mute in the Decapolis. As children of Adam, we are conceived and born hard of hearing, born slow of speech. We're deaf to God's word, mute of prayer and praise. We don't like to hear when God speaks, nor do we naturally have words of prayer and praise on our lips. Our ears are blocked. Our tongues are tied. Instead, what we hear is the noise that actually comes from within ourselves. And it's sad to say this, but we prefer it. We prefer our words over God's. We like our words, our wisdom, our self-justifications, and all the ways that we build ourselves up. Put another way, we like our own spiritual static. Because in our lost condition, tongues know only how to revile God and to speak evil of His Word and of others. And what does Jesus do? He interrupts the noise and the static. He intrudes into our own spiritual commotion. The scripture, Scriptures say plainly, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Jesus cries, open up! And those words... Those words create something that was not there before. Creatio ex nihilo. Creation out of nothing. And what is there? Faith. All from His Word. Moreover, He takes hold of our tied up tongues, which thereby release thanksgiving and confession and pray and prayers. Beloved, my point is, if the Lord does not open our lips and loosen our tongues, there will be no praise nor any prayer to come out of us. This previously mute man and his astonished friends, boy, they are thrilled. And you would be too. They're exhilarated. They can't contain themselves. What? But yet, what does Jesus tell them? Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Well, why not? Because Jesus does not want the man to talk with his new tongue until he has listened with his new ears. 
talk with your new tongue after listening with your new ears. And this is a good lesson for all of us. If we don't listen before we speak, then our good intentions will get in the way and we will say things and do things from immaturity and foolishness and inexperience. And this is a wonderful encouragement for daily Bible reading. This actually is a wonderful encouragement to attend adult Bible class. Jesus makes a disciple one time at baptism and then continuing the discipleship program or process, he teaches them over and over and over and over for the rest of their lives. And it is only listening and learning and treasuring up his word before we talk about him that we know the right things to say. This is how we grow. This is how we learn, and then we speak, teaching others. Well, the people marvel. They are astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. And I have to say that when that is said, this right here, this text, is the high point of Jesus' public ministry in the gospel according to Mark. This is it. This is the pinnacle. Because with that, he then begins to set his eye towards the cross. And the people who are saying he has done all things well, they eventually say, what? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. You know, the physical healings that Jesus performed during his life were only the beginnings. The very slightest beginning of the great miracles and the gifts that he will give on the last day in the resurrection. I mean, this man whom Jesus restored, he became deaf and mute again at his death. Just as we all will when we die. It's true of all of Jesus' healing ministries. Even Lazarus. I mean, he had the blessing of a second funeral. They're all done for a temporary period of time. So what does this mean? It means that Jesus' healing miracles teach us about the greatest miracle of all, that God, who became man, dies for you. And not just for those who seem to deserve it, because as you know, none do, but He dies for the whole world, every last one of us, for every deaf, every mute, every possessed, every sinfully rotten one of us. He dies to free you from a much greater disability than the lack of hearing or the lack of speaking. He dies so that your guilt might be His. He dies to forgive you the sin that you keep falling back into, your constant drunkenness, your constant addictions, your constant anger, your constant selfishness, your constant doubts. He dies for it all. And it's that forgiveness that you receive when He gives you His very body and His very blood. When He opens your lips so that you may also declare His praise and He gives you joy to a burdened soul and He gives life to your dying bodies. And one day, should you die before He returns, He will stand upon the earth and He will say that the same word that this deaf man heard. He will say, F -f -f be opened. What will be opened is your grave. And you will come forth under a new heaven, standing on a new earth, in a new glorified body. Amazing. And this is the hope that you can cling to all because Jesus has died for you and forgiving you of all of your sins. Beloved, it is true. He has done all things well. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer.